So I continue with 4.3. 4.1 was change of length, as described by the diagonal elements. 4.2 was change of angle, change of orientation of two vectors relative to each other. And we have chosen a special example. 4.3 now is about finding out whether this, what we write down as normal elements and diagonal elements, and non-diagonal elements in a matrix, whether this object is a tensor or not. Now, normal change of length, gamma, combination of those two terms, which represent the non-diagonal elements of a general tensor, of a general <laughs> matrix. Um, those elements can be summarized in index notation. This is always handy to do because it's one equation instead of six. In index notation, you can have ij one half dui dxj plus duj dxi. Take this and see whether it's the same as the epsilon one one. And actually, it is. If i equals j equals one, and you just sum up the two, multiply by one half, and it's the same. Take this object and see whether it's the same as gamma one, two. If you insert one and two, okay, and actually you observe it's not. The summation is the same, but we have a prefactor of one half. Okay, so the trick to get it into a matrix is not really possible because we get the first terms right, but the second terms get a factor of one half. But if we do this, if we play this trick, then we can write it in index notation, and that means we can write it in a matrix using one single formula and not six different ones. Okay, now, uh, in shorter notation, shorter index notation, the partial derivative is replaced by the comma. So ui comma j is the same as dui dxj. Okay, so if we have this definition, let's see whether this is already the valid tensor definition. Okay, in different notations, the strain tensor can be written as underscore, double underscore would be better to indicate its order also, but in some books you find it with a single, sometimes a double. Okay, in index notation, it is epsilon ij, these are the components, and ei, ej are the unit vectors giving the direction. So in this notation, you see that the tensor practically has two directions. A vector has one, a vector has one index and one direction. A tensor has two indices and two directions. A vector is a row or a column. A matrix is the product of two vectors, as I showed you, can be written as a product of two vectors. Okay, and that means it implies two directions also. And actually, this is the reason why you need two transformation matrices. You have to have one transformation for the first vector, unit vector, and another transformation for the second unit vector. Okay, now inserting the definition in this matrix form uh, gives us the diagonal elements unchanged, and it gives us the one half gamma terms on the non-diagonal. Okay, now let's work with this one. I know it's the better tensor. The other one is if we would put gamma here, it would not be a tensor. So let's work with this one where I imply that I know the answer. And let's prove by confirming that the transformation behavior is that of a tensor. I think that is more useful than working with the wrong definition and finding out that the transformation is not true. Any one of you who wants to do it, please feel free to do, to do so. Now, in different notations, 1, 2 is replaced by x, y, z. So just if you see it in a different book, in a different material, somewhere in a different publication uh, with different notation, you still have to recognize that it's the same thing. It's only about nomenclature notation. It can be different. The meaning does not change. Okay, now the question to be answered is, are the epsilon ij the components of a second order tensor? We write them in a matrix. They look like a tensor. Prove this first. 
Okay, and in order to do so, uh, we need a little, a few elements which I then bring together. So, repetition, apply rotation of a coordinate axis from one of the coordinates old to new. Okay, so we remember that this corresponds to the applying the transformation matrix to this vector, RPI times XI. This is the operation, this is the long form, this is the very long form, and XP prime is the new vector after transformation. Okay, for the deformation components now, we have the strain, we have vector U here, and we have derivatives. So what we did in the first line was defining the vector transformation. So that one we can see back here. So the dx, the x prime, and we play a trick which you can do with derivatives. We derive the variable ui first with respect to an arbitrary object. And then we take this object and derive it with respect to the original denominator. Okay, this is called series rule in analysis. Okay, we apply the series rule, we insert something, and this something we have transformed already before. Okay, now when you insert this here, then you get the R and you get the U and the X prime. Okay, we want to do the same thing for the displacement vector, that one transforms like it does here, like it's shown here, okay? And from that one, inserting into the transformation rule again and again, we get something which lives in the new coordinate system. The primes are on top and on bottom and has two times the transformation matrix. And this is the first element from the definition of strain. This is the second element from the definition of strain. You just have to make sure that you don't miss or leave out or swap an index. Now, the transformation matrix can be taken out of the bracket. The one half is already out of the bracket. What uh, we have here then is the definition of the strain tensor in the new coordinate system. Before, this was the definition in the old coordinate system. This is the definition in the new coordinate system. Together with the transformation matrices, uh, it looks like this. Okay, and this is the proof that the tensor epsilon pq prime transforms via two transformation matrices to the original tensor. Or you can invert this, then it's going other way around. Okay, so this is the proof, the mathematical proof that epsilon as defined on here is indeed a tensor. If you, if we would have used, if you would have used definition of the one from the previous slide, if we would have used gamma here and not one half gamma, then the transformation would not have led to an equal here. Okay, so now summary of this transformation rules from new to old. This is the transformation rule as of a second order tensor and from old to new, original to new. Uh, this is the, the transformation rule in different notations, nothing new. Okay, so indeed the epsilon ij are components of a second order tensor because they follow the correct transformation rule. By construction, the transformation tensor is already symmetric, so it's transposed is equal to the original. Okay, and if you want to do the derivation for an arbitrarily oriented line segment PQ, take carrying along all the position and so on, then you can also look in the reader, but you won't need this for the axon. So this is only for those of you who really are pain resistant. This is pain. Now, end of 4.3, I pr have shown you that epsilon as defined before, including the diagonal elements, which mean change of length, including the non-diagonal elements, which mean change of angle, but only half of it. So I have shown that this object is indeed a second order tensor. Now, that has, that has consequences. And one of them is 
that we can uh, calculate principal strains and principal direction, as I will do after two, three minutes break. Let me check the questions.